Okay, the primary thing I'm talking about, and I'll just, let's see if I've got this turned on, pardon me. That should be better, can you hear me now? Okay. The primary thing I'm talking about is private debt, but I'll finish up with a bit on climate change as well, after I get to the last slide. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about private debt is because mainstream economics ignores it. And that's, to me, it's the classic elephant in the room. And for 50 years, people who I've followed, people like uh, Augusto Graziani, Basil Moore, Harmon Ninsky, uh, Wynne Godley, have all been arguing that you have to concern yourself with private debt and credit, and the mainstream has been disparaging and ignoring us. So this is part of a so well, they call it a debate, it was more of a slanging match that I had with Krugman in 2012, where he made this quite definitive statement. First of all, an individual bank does, in fact, have to lend out money it receives in deposits. And he hopes it isn't controversial, but he's sure it's going to cause outrage. Well, it did. The Bank of England was outraged. And much to my pleasure, uh, after literally half a century, probably, of just being able to quote my fellow rebels about this, I'm now able to quote the Bank of England and say that proposition by Krugman is nonsense. It deserves to be treated with outrage, it's wrong. Banks, rather than banks receiving deposits when households save and then lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. It's as simple and definitive a statement as I could hope for, except for one made by the Bundesbank in 2017, saying it's a money and credit are created a result of a complex interaction between banks, non-banks and the central bank. And to say it's just loans create deposits is a simplification. Uh, there's an excellent uh, post I'm trying to remember the author now, it's Cullen Roach or, um, no it's not Cullen Roach, but somebody else pointing out, you, when you create the reserves and the deposits, when you create the deposits with the loans, you also create reserve requirements and equity requirements. So it's not just as straightforward as loans create deposits on their own, but it's part of a three-part process. And the Bundesbank does a good job of stating that there as well. And notice they say this refutes a popular misconception well, it's not a popular misconception, it's one held by Nobel Prize winners. Okay. The public, generally speaking, is more likely to understand what the Bundesbank is talking about than people with Nobel Prizes in economics, which I hope makes you question the Nobel Prize. Now, again, a later uh, time when he's trashing another person who's one of the handful who saw the crisis coming, both uh, uh, through the 2008 crisis and also troubles in Japan, this is Richard Koo, he, again, disparages Kuh for saying he envisages an economy in which everyone is balance sheet constrained, as opposed to where some, lots of people, but some people are not. And he says, that makes no sense. Where there are debtors, there must also be creditors. So there have to be some people who can respond to a lower rate of interest, even in a balance sheet recession. In other words, what he's saying is, when uh, interest rates are high, it's difficult for borrowers, but it's easy for lenders. When borrowers repay, lenders have more repaying power. Uh, so there's no real change in spending power when debt goes up or down. Now, that was understood to be false by people like Irving Fisher before the Second World War. And even people like uh, Kigou in a book called uh, uh, Industrial Fluctuations because they say there's a big difference between a debt between two individuals, a man-to-man -man debt, as Fisher puts it there, and a bank debt. And quoting Fisher from 1932, a man-to-man -man debt may be paid off without affecting the volume of outstanding currency. Whatever is paid by one is received by the other. A debt to a commercial bank is paid, the amount of debt cost in currency simply disappears. So this was understood by conventional economists prior to the 1940s. That's really American neoclassical economics, which has taken us backwards into a mythical world in which banks are just exactly the same as non-banks. Uh, and as a result of this attitude, Fisher's arguments about what caused the Great Depression, an excellent paper I recommend you all read called The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions. This was rejected by Bernanke because he said uh, it didn't make any sense to, uh, to act, it was convincing to Roosevelt, and thank God it was, uh, but it was less influential in academic circles because of the counter-argument that debt deflation is no more than a redistribution of, from one group to another's 
and absent and plausibly large differences in spending, pure redistributions should have no significant macroeconomic effects. Now that was the end of his really serious consideration of, 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 uh, of, of Fisher. In the entire book, he devoted 24 words to Hyman Minsky and, uh, and Charles Kindleberger, so completely dismissing, not even considering the argument they made on a priori grounds like that. Now, thankful, thankfully, I can point to the central banks and say, reject what these academic economists think they know. Central banks do know that banks create money when they lend. They don't intermediate. They are originators, they are not intermediators. Well, what are the implications of that? Well, since these papers have come out from central banks, mainstream economists can no longer just simply dismiss the whole idea. They can ignore people like me. It's rather hard to ignore the Bundesbank. So they're now bringing up models, and the attempt in these models, with one exception, is to try to prove it doesn't matter anyway. So one of the most recent papers, a couple called Foer and Gerbash in 2017, using what's known as an overlapping generations model, concluded that all the phenomena that matter between the two only relate to default risk. So if you can assume no default risk, you can just use the simpler model. Now that alone is absurd. 10 years after the financial crisis, let's assume no, assume no bank default. But I want to focus just on the argument. Is that true? Okay. Now, other models, and particularly work by the, the research director of the Bank of England, Michael Kumoff and a colleague, with using DSGE models, he does find significant impacts. He said comparing ident otherwise identical, and notice the word, intermediation models, and finally following identical shocks, financing models, meaning models in which banks create money, uh, have far larger changes, far faster, much greater effects on the real economy. So we've got the mainstream having two attitudes. One says it doesn't matter, the other said it's significant. Well, clearly, normally I say the mainstream is 100% wrong, but here they've got to be 50% wrong. One of these two views must be wrong, which one? Well, I want to show very logically, very simply, why you can't dismiss credit simply on the basis that one person's asset is another person's liability, which of course is true. So what I do is I, I divide the economy into three sectors. This is all, I can have any number of sectors, but three illustrates the point very simply, where each sector is spending on the other two sectors. And I call this a Moore table after Basil Moore, who was really the, the uh, pioneer of the theory of endogenous money, which I now call the theory of bank-originated money and debt, uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, 70s. And the table shows expenditure by each sector on the other sectors. So in the, on the diagonal of a matrix, I'm going to show the expenditure which, as a negative coming out of that particular agent or sector's bank account. And the off-diagonal elements on the same row are where that money is spent. So necessarily, each row sums to zero. And what that is basically saying is the classic macroeconomic identity, expenditure is identical to income. Okay. Now on that basis alone, Krugman rejects the importance of banks. I want to show who's wrong. Now the column sums show the expenditure by a particular sector and the income. The sum of the column is the gap between expenditure and income, which can be positive or negative. But each row must be, simply for mathematical consistency, each row must sum to zero. And I look at three arrangements, what I'm calling Say's Law and in inverted commas, where no lending is possible. So it's just circulation of existing money. Loanable funds, Paul Krugman's favourite model, where there's lending between one sector to another, and I show that there's a transfer of money along the diagonal. So it's not an expenditure of goods and services, it's a financial transfer, and they go along the diagonal of the matrix. And finally, the real world, as I can now confidently say, with the backing of the Bank of England and the Bundesbank, the Bank of Norway, and last time I noticed also even the Reserve Bank of Australia, though a sensible person there, so it's a bit of an exception. Uh, bank originated money and debt, where there's a fourth sector, the banking sector, and I'm showing the transactions just on the liability and equity side of the bank. I can't show the asset side because it would just be too small a table to read, I think, I, I might try the, a later presentation. Uh, so what happens when the bank lends, its assets rises, rise and its liabilities rise at the same time. So looking at the Say's Law uh, position, uh, you can see the diagonal, I've got expenditure of seg by sector one, 
is A dollars per year on sector two and B dollars per year on sector three, and necessarily that row sums to zero. The same thing for sector two spending on sectors one and three, and sector three spending on sectors one and two. So all rows must sum to zero, just to be mathematically correct. So there's expenditure by sector one. That's the income generated by that expenditure. This is why expenditure is identical to income at the macroeconomic level. And that's income by sector one, which of course can differ from expenditure by sector one. Now that effectively gives you Milton Friedman's quantity theory of money. There's a set amount of money in the economy. It's turning over through trade. And the total sum of activity you can pretty much call the velocity of money multiplied by the amount of money in circulation. And this is, again, starting with the identity that aggregate demand is identical to aggregate income. So if you take the sum of the, neg of the negative sum of the diagonal elements there, you have aggregate expenditure. If you take the sum of the off-diagonal, you have ag aggregate income. They are necessarily equal. And what they're equal to is basically the turnover of existing money. That's the Milton Friedman world. With loanable funds, I have sector two lending sector one with that flow of money being shown along the trace of the diagonal, and then sector one paying interest to sector two, which is the only reason sector two is making the loan. And then sector one spends on sector three. And I could make it more complicated than that, but this case covers all possible circumstances very simply. So I'm calling the flow of money credit. So credit is flowing out of sector two's account into sector one's, and then sector one is spending that credit on sector three, and because the money was lent to raise interest, there's a payment of interest by sector one to sector two as well. Now all rows still sum to zero. If I add up those rows, I get one interesting change over Milton Friedman's world, and that is that interest payments don't cancel out. Okay? I'd need a negative for the interest payments along here, I don't get it. So aggregate demand includes the turnover of existing money plus gross financial transactions. So that's one difference between Lionel Funds and Milton Friedman's world that I don't think the neoclassicals themselves are aware of. But the important point is credit cancels out. So if that did describe the real world, you could ignore credit in, a, in macroeconomics. Now what about the real world? Bank originated money and debt. So I have bank, the banking sector lending to sector one, which creates both money and off the table I'm showing here, creates that as well. And sector one then spends that on sector three. So the same basic arrangement as the previous time with credit being created, only it's being created by a bank creating money and creating debt at the same time. Now you do your same sum and you find credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. That's why it matters. It has a macroeconomic impact. That's why I was making the points I made in last night's panel. Uh, all the discussion about the impact of the financial sector just talks about whether the banks are going to go bankrupt because their assets might be less than their liabilities. Yes, that's important. Yes, that's what causes a serious crash, an instantaneous one, during a financial crisis. But this macroeconomic impact applies throughout the economy and all the economic circumstances. And because credit is such a large part of, large relative to total turnover of money, it's an, the most, one of the most important indicators of the state of the economy, which is ignored by mainstream economics completely and wrongly. And that's why they couldn't see the crisis coming. So you can't ignore credit, and you can't ignore banking and money and debt in macroeconomics. If you do, you're not modelling capitalism. And because it's so volatile, it has the biggest impact upon the economy. So I illustrate this using my software pa package Minsky, which is an open source, i.e. free, uh, software package for modelling system dynamics with special feature for doing monetary flows, which we call a godly table after Win Godly. And this lets you flow model financial flows very, very easily. So I built a model of Krugman and Egertsen's idea of loanable funds, where they had a consumer agent lending to an investment agent. And this is the model in Minsky. Minsky is far more sophisticated than what Krugman and co did because their, their model of banking was extremely clumsy, putting it politely. 
Uh, but this is with Minsky, you can make up a list of assets, liability and equity, and you can do it from the point of view of any entity in the system. So this is showing it from the bank's point of view. The bank has reserves, which are the sum of all the deposits plus its own equity. The lending goes from the consumer sector's deposit account to the investment sector's deposit account. Repayment goes in the opposite direction. The investment sector pays interest to the consumer sector for the loan. The consumer sector pays a fee to the bank for doing the intermediation services, as the mainstream model thinks ha things happen. And then you have hiring of workers by both sectors, purchase of intermediate goods by both sectors, consumption by workers, consumption and investment by bankers. Okay. That's the logic. It's quite easy. To, that would be a mess if I used the usual system dynamics approach of cables to try to explain that, but I think that's pretty straightforward to everybody. And then this is looking at exactly the same system from the consumer sector's point of view. Now you might notice when you're looking at it, debt doesn't turn up on the bank's table. Why? Because in the loanable funds model, debt is not an asset of the banking sector. The bank's just an intermediation service. The debt is an asset of the lender. In this case, it's the consumer sector. So there I have the debt, and lending involves transferring money from its deposit account to its debt. Repayment goes in the opposite direction. Interest payments increase its net worth. Paying the fee to the bank reduces its net worth. Now, what happens when I simulate this model? Does lending matter? Over here, I've got the capacity to change the rate of lending and the rate of repayment. So I've currently got it set up so that lending effectively doubles the outstanding debt every seven years and repayment halves it every nine years. And I can run the simulation and change those dynamically and see what happens to the economy. So I'll run the simulation. Notice the growth rate is zero. GDP is 200, say billion pounds. Velocity of money is constant. The debt ratio has risen, is now stabilized. There's been an increase in debt, but no change in the level of money in the economy, because debt's not creating additional money. If I speed up lending, watch what happens to the growth rate. Notice it fell. Okay. And now if I slow down repayment, it falls again, even more. Because in this model, the consumer sector has a higher propensity to consume in the investment sector. So the consumer sector lends, economic activity actually drops. This is the loanable funds vision of the world. Now notice what's happened to the debt level. The debt ratio has risen quite dramatically. No change in the money supply. GDP is still about 200. And if I now slow down lending and increase how fast repayment occurs, notice a bit of a boom occurs for a short while. Then it all drops back to much the same level as before. So what you've got with this model is you can have gigantic changes in the debt to GDP rate, private debt, to GDP ratio, and bugger all impact upon the real economy. So if loanable funds was correct, yes, you could ignore the banking sector. That's why they hang on to this model so much, because they want to ignore the banking sector, because as soon as you bring it in, if it matters, you get disequilibrium. Can't have that. Well, this, of course, is garbage. That's not the real world. What I can do in Minsky very rapidly is convert it to the real world. So I can come to here and say, this is the, the way you think debt is an asset of the consumer sector. Well, it's not. So I can delete that column. And when I do, I delete the debt as an asset, but it still exists in the model as a liability of the investment sector. So I'll do that, and I'll delete the, for the financial flows don't occur between the consumer sector and the investment sector. They occur between the investment sector and the bank. So I've done that, I can now come across to the bank's table, and so let's make space for an additional asset. And I click on this down arrow, Minsky goes and checks for any liability that isn't currently allocated as an asset to somebody else in the system, and of course it finds debt is there. I click on that and it brings across those operations, so it's now made those two rows correct. I've deleted the financial transactions, so I need to add those back in. So interest payments are made to the bank, not to the uh, consumer sector. And the, let's forget about the bank fee. Yes, the banks charge fees, but not as important as the interest they charge on debt. Now, I should make a couple more changes to be fully consistent, but that's, I just want to show you how tiny the changes need to be to bring about a dramatic change in the importance of banks in the system. So we go back and reset the model. 
starting with the same lending parameters, lending, doubling, I'll just change my indicator here, lending, doubling, debt every seven years, repayment halving every nine, run that, and you now get a growing GDP, changing the amount of money, is, of debt is changing the amount of money directly, and if I now have an increase in how fast lending occurs, I get a boom, not a slump, and a slowdown in repayment, even more of a boom, and then if you have a reversal, so people repay debt more rapidly and banks lend more slowly, you have a slump. That's why the mainstream missed the financial crisis completely. They ignored what caused it. Because of a structural model of banking which is absolutely false. And that's why we have to get rid of mainstream economics, one of many reasons. I'll give you a second one in the second half of the talk. So that's just shown you that their model, huge changes in credit and debt, nothing happens, you can ignore the banking sector. In the real world, which is easily modelled using Minsky, dramatic changes in credit and debt, dramatic changes in GDP as well. You can't ignore them. And the stats also make a mockery of Bernanke's claim that there's no significant macroeconomic impact. And this data was available to Bernanke when he made those statements. When you look at the debt data and the credit data, it's clear that's what caused the financial crisis. Now, it's clear if you actually understand what the numbers are. And having a neoclassical degree is a good way of being able to understand what the bloody hell you're looking at. And I found this marvellous example from a guy called Leo Harnian, who's a major uh, research colleague of Kidland and Prescott, the guys who designed real business cycle modelling. And he dismissed the explanation that the financial crisis was caused by the financial sector in 2010, paper written in 2010 and said, notice he's calling it intermediation services too, not banking. Uh, so he said, well, there's no, there's been, uh, figure four shows that bank credit relative to nominal GDP rose at the end of 2008 to an all-time high, declined in the first quarter of 2010, which is when he was writing, when he published the paper, um, but still at a higher point than any time before t halfway to 2008. So aggregate quantities have not declined significantly. Sounds pretty convincing, doesn't it? This is his figure four. Take a good look at that figure. It does say the ratio of bank credit. Okay? That's what the statistician titles the series. He interprets credit as change in debt, which is what I define credit as. But what he's saying, without even realising it, he's saying the change in debt each year is t twice GDP. What the hell would the level of debt be if the rate of change was twice GDP every year? You'd be talking tens of thousands of times, given that length of the series. Debt being millions of times GDP. Clearly it's not change in debt. That has to be the ratio of private debt to GDP. See, not only can he not read a chart properly, neither could the editor of the Journal of Economic Perspectives or the referees. They let that get through. Now, I think we've got no better proof that they are, with apologies to morons, they're morons on banking and finance. And that is the basis of the so-called education you get doing an economics degree where you get taught on the neoclassical theory. It's outrageously bad. And I want to show why, because all I have to do is look at the rate of change of that time series. That's the blue line. It's slightly different time series, different data sources. You can see the shape is the same. So there's, changing my pointer again, pardon me. That's roughly the series that Harney was looking at to dismiss it. When you look at the rate of change, that's what's happened in 2008. For the whole period from 1950 all the way out to 2007, credit was positive and running at about 15% of GDP at its peak. When the crisis hit, it fell from plus 15 to minus 5. That's the crisis. So the statistic screams that credit matters. And you have to be congenitally unable to think about the banking sector to make mistakes like that. Now, they're not stupid people. They're very intelligent people. 
but they've been trained to think about the economy in a stupid way. And we paid the price for it in 2008, and we're going to pay the price for it in terms of climate change as well. Now, when you look at that credit and look at what the correlation is with unemployment, they're virtually mirror images of each other. Since 1990, the correlation of the change in debt, which is credit, as a percentage of GDP, with the unemployment rate is minus 0.85. That's not, that's not even a model, that's just a simple correlation. I could do better than that if I put it into a model to try to estimate it. What about the housing sector? Well, the change in household credit, which is the acceleration of household debt, has a 0.71 correlation with the change in house prices. So there's no way the financial crisis was a black swan. It was simply a failure to look at the important data by the mainstream of the profession. That's why it happened. So, how the hell did we get to this state? Now, I've called this the degeneration of macroeconomics, because we've gone massively backwards, something Paul Romer said in his uh, couple of paper a couple of years ago as well. It was driven by the desire for sound foundations. And if you look at the literature and see where did this come from, people like Lucas, uh, this is an ex extemporary speech he gave to the History of Political Economy group in uh, America in 2003. He said, the theory ought to be microeconomically founded. In other words, he's looking for a sound foundation for macroeconomics. And I agree we need sound foundations. And he argued nobody was satisfied with ISLM. Doing it with microeconomics, that's the way to get it done. But that is the wrong foundation. Uh, all, I cover quite a bit of this in debunking economics as to why you can't use micro as a foundation for macro. But there's a brilliant paper, very easy to read, by a genuine Nobel Prize winner in physics, Philip Anderson, talking about effectively the discovery of, com discovery of complexity by physicists in the uh, 60s and 70s. So the behaviour of large and complex aggregates is not to be understood in terms of a simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles, which is precisely the way that neoclassicals derive their so-called micro-founded models. So at each level, new complexities appear, and the understanding of these requires research which is as fundamental in its nature as any other. And he ends up by saying, biology, psychology is not applied biology, and equally, I'd add to that, macroeconomics is not applied micro. It's simply the wrong foundation. Now, you can actually build a foundation working from the aggregate down. You can, develop, you can build macro on macro. And I want to show how, they, how easily that's done and the power of doing it that way. So I'm going to take three macroeconomic definitions, which are indisputable. The employment rate is how many people have a job divided by population. The wage share of GDP is the wage bill divided by GDP. The debt ratio is the amount of private debt divided by GDP. Differentiate those with respect to time so I'm still working with strictly definitions, just now in terms of rates of change over time. And those are equally definitional statements. The employment rate will rise, this is the equations for them. The hat means 1 over x dx dt, whatever the thing under the hat might be. So the percentage rate of change of the employment rate, the model is saying there, is the percentage rate of growth of, of the economy minus the sum of the percentage rates of growth of labour productivity and population. The wage of share of output is a percentage is equal to the rate of growth of wage demands minus the rate of growth of labour productivity. And the private debt ratio, amazingly enough, will grow if debt grows faster than GDP. Okay? So that's all still definitions. Now I can turn that into a model by adding an extremely simple behavioural concepts. And whereas neoclassicals get their knickers in a twist trying to imagine these rational agents with future expectations and forward-looking this and blah de blah de blah uh, This is just saying, just make it simple and linear, okay? You don't need to have anything complicated to get these results. So I'm going to have output as a linear function of the amount of capital, investment as a linear function of the rate of profit, employment a linear function of output, wages change a linear function of the employment rate, and change in debt simply financing investment. So I have no Ponzi behaviour going on here. Every dollar borrowed is to build something that produces output. Now, looking at the equations, again, they're extremely simple. Just output is capital divided by capital output ratio. 
Uh, the rate of change of capital is gross investment minus depreciation. I use a linear Phillips curve. Please read Phillips. You'll see he used the non-linear one, and he had three causal factors, not one. And he was trying to build models just like I'm showing you now. He wasn't talking about a, a menu trader. That's all distortions of Phillips by the mainstream literature. A linear investment function, debt financing investment, and a constant rate of growth in population and labour productivity. Put that together, and I get an extremely simple model. It might not look all that simple, but it really is simple. There's just three differential equations. So I've got the rate of change of the employment rate here, the rate of change of wages here, the rate of change of debt. Everything in red is either a system state, those three variables, or something depending upon them. So investment depends upon the rate of profit, wage change depends upon employment, the profit rate depends upon profit share. And it's just three variables and eight parameters. And it takes about, if you're decent at calculus, it takes about 10 minutes to do that. It's nothing like as hard as deriving your initial DSGE model, which might, might take you 10 weeks instead. And it's like the equations that was used by meteorologists to explain the instability in the weather. Now, when I simulate that, I get two potential outcomes. And I'll show you one, that, that first one there, pardon me, is a nice convergence to equilibrium. As you can see, the employment rate converges over time to a stationary level, so does the wage of share, so does the debt rate. And if I then change the model so that I make capitalists more willing to invest, I get this sort of behaviour. And I was waiting for a... I must have changed my model there not to have the... Uh, I made a mistake in terms of putting that model there. Give me a second to see if I can find the um, model I'm trying to show you there. Let's see. Okay. So this is that model. And I'm going to simulate it with a low level of desire by capitalists to invest. And over time it converges nice and smoothly to equilibrium. Now, if I change the model and have capitalists having a higher desire to invest, initially it'll look like the previous system. Notice it's getting stable more quickly. The cycles are diminishing very rapidly, which neoclassical economists saw in the real world and called the Great Moderation. Then look at what happens. The cycles get bigger, finally leading to a breakdown. Now those are very big cycles and you can rule them out because they look too big to be part of the real world. The whole reason for using nonlinear behavioural relations in a complex systems model is to make it more realistic. So if I simply say, well let's actually presume that the model is not is uh, nonlinear, so there's a nonlinear relationship between investment and profit and ditto between wage uh, employment rate and wages. You get the same basic structure, but more compressed. Closer to what you see in the real world. You still get a breakdown. Now, if you look at what actually is going on there, I'll just go back a few illustrations there. This is with the linear model yet again. That incredibly simple model reproduces the most important stylized facts of the last 40 years. First of all, there was a diminishing and then rising cycles, the Great Moderation followed by the Great Recession. Neoclassicals are still trying to understand both those phenomena. One they take the credit for, the other call they call an exogenous shock. Okay? Rising debt ratio, private debt rising as I showed you in those previous uh, empirical da data, and rising inequality because workers get less and bankers get more. Capitalists, as it happens, fall out even until the whole system collapses. So in this model, fundamentally, workers pay for the high level of debt, even though they're not doing any borrowing of money in this model. So the income distribution effect of higher debt is to reduce workers' income, which increases inequality. Well, that's out of the simplest possible model I can build. And I can go further by adding in, that's, that's the nonlinear one I meant to bring up earlier, as I've shown you. And you can include prices, which is in this model. And I get a more complex behaviour still. It's still an incredibly simple model. 
just to simulate that one, where I now have price dynamics turning up, monetary flow of demand and monetary flow of supply, and a convergence, convergence but potential, but also a potential for deflation. And what you get out of that, quite intriguingly, is the last people that know that capitalism is crashing are the capitalists, because their low rate of profit fluctuates near an equilibrium, not around it, by the way, but near it, and then when everything looks nice and stable, that's when it collapses. So a complex systems view of the world lets you know that you can't, you can't treat it in a simple linear system. You have to think very, in a complex systems feedback way about the real world, or you're not, even, you're not thinking about the real world at all. And unfortunately, that's the state of neoclassical economics. Now, what I've shown you there is the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with system dynamics. Uh, some students of mine have built models of their national economies using Minsky, which are more accurate than anything built by any of the national governments in those countries. So that is a model of the Portuguese economy, done by Pedro Pratas. I won't try to run it for you. It's, it's, it, the documentation is still an issue in Minsky, but that accurately reproduces out of sample data about the Portuguese economy far better than the Reserve Bank or the, uh, the Central Bank or the um, Treasury managed to do with their DSGE models. And this is a model of the shadow banking sector by one of my ex-students, I'm very pleased to say, who is now working at the Bank of England researching shadow banking. So there's enormous potential in this modelling approach. And we need to bring this into economics despite the protests of neoclassicals. And one of my favourite quotes about this comes from an a Australian, Austrian-born Australian mathematician called John Blatt, died about 35, 40 years ago, was horrified by what he found out was what neoclassical economists thought was mathematical economics. He wrote a brilliant book called Dynamic Economic Systems. I've got that link on my debt deflation site and I'll put it up on my Patreon site today, actually. I've been putting it off for too long. But in talking about the state of what neo economists called dynamics, he said a baby is expected to first crawl and then walk before running. But what if a grown up man is still crawling? At present, talking in 1982, the state of our dynamic economics is more akin to a crawl than a walk, to say nothing of a run. And I used to think this was a hyperbolic statement, but the closer we get to climate breakdown, the more realistic it becomes. Some think that capitalism as a social system may disappear before its dynamics are understood by economists. And I unfortunately think that's becoming true, a true statement. So we need a complex systems approach to economics. Universities won't develop it because they're dominated by the neoclassicals. It's likely to happen, if anywhere, in the uh, official bodies that actually have to reach some rel relevance to the real world, places like the Bank of England, the Bundesbank, even the World Bank these days, and rebels like me. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> Fiat currencies, uh, people have been predicting the end of fiat currencies for as long as there have been Austrian economists. Um, they haven't been particularly successful for the last 150 years. I don't think that the system itself will break down as they think it will. Um, international currencies, I think the greatest example of the success of an international currency is the euro. And thank God you guys don't belong to it. Okay, it's a disaster. Um, so I don't think an international currency makes sense either, except for international trade, where I wish we had the bank call. And uh, just another extra small question on top of it. What do you think about the amount of 
which again then? Unfunded obligation, especially on pension. Ah, uh, you mean like pension funds? So, uh, uh, you mean like superannuation funds? It's, and uh, basically why I mean by like unfunded obligation is uh, those those funds that government promised to pay, but they are never going to be able to pay. That's completely irrelevant. This is one thing modern monetary theory gets quite right. It's not the amount of money you're giving out to pensioners at time X that matters. It's how much of your productive capacity at time X can you afford to devote to people who aren't producing at that time. And what really matters is how much investment you achieve rather than how much money you have in the, in the uh, pensioners' accounts. And all this fixation on saving money for pensioners has actually ended up in the money going into financing asset bubbles rather than building industrial equipment as we actually need. So I think it's a, I think it's a false problem. It's what Australians call a furphy. And uh, once we realise what we really need to be worrying about is our productive capacity and financing the construction of that. The idea of putting inside enough money for pensioners doesn't matter if that money is not actually generating the productive capacity we need to give to them to keep them alive. Thank you. I'm about to come up and listen to you because the acoustics in this room are dreadful, sorry. There's uh, people and uh, complex systems and in a similar way that you do, basically there are models from the right and I think you know, they use all the down here. Uh, what do you think? It's, yeah. Uh, um, e economics has had a very unusual hang up on believing it has to derive everything from micro foundations right since Smith. And if you look at genuine sciences, and there's no way economics is a genuine science, They've all gone top down. The equations that gave us Lorenz's model are top down models, not what not what's it, what is an individual molecule of hydrogen H2O doing. It's the aggregate system. So you do you do modelling in the aggregate first, and then after you've exhausted what you can do that way, then you might add in micro work later. That's the way it happens in the genuine sciences. So I'm not opposed to multi-agent modelling. I've got two PhD students one who's finished, have done doing multi-agent models, but they found they, they started off with grand ambitions and at the end they did something interesting but far less than they expected because the overhead in doing that programming is astronomical. Um, so and interpreting those models is incredibly hard. So I think I'd rather say start with the top-down stuff and then later on do the multi-agent rather than going multi-agent first. This is a great place to acquire a terrible place for a lecture. Yeah? Well, um, you said it's, I mean, in terms of this research area of using complex systems inside the economics, you're still quite low. Um, but I think in the USA there is the Santa Fe Institute, which is doing quite interesting stuff yeah. with complex yeah. economics. And what do you think is necessary to kind of enhance this research area of economics, also to maybe universities and other institutions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, To me, the complex systems approach is the way to go because it, the first past a capitalism is a complex system, but a second past it's a complex evolutionary system. And we can certainly handle complex systems. We can't handle the evolutionary systems as easily, um, but that to me is the way to go in general. And if you're going to learn it, forget about learning it in the economics department. Go to a mathematics department or engineering and learn complex systems from them. For its second nature. This, so, it, engineers have been using this software for 40 or 50 years now. Uh, it's commonplace in engineering to use tools like Simulink or VizSim. Management use packages like iThink and Stella. Uh, you are massively undereducated if you do an economics degree compared to somebody who studies engineering and learns system dynamics or anything of that nature. So I, I think the real future for economics, if you, if you want to do something original economics and not be hampered by learning <coughs> neoclassical, learn the neoclassical enough to pass the exams and know which journal papers to read, but study system dynamics under an engineering department. That's the best way to go. Yep. So you're just 
I'm, I'm no fan of game. I'm no fan of game theory, even evolutionary game theory. Uh, to me, evolutionary modelling is much more sophisticated than that. Um, and that you, there was, you're not trying to work out an equilibrium in an evolutionary system. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so the whole idea of using equilibrium as your guiding point. To me, the equilibrium fetish that neoclassical economics has is by far its worst problem. And just putting that fetish in the game theory uh, context, I think, does bugger all to get away from the problem of believing everything converges to equilibrium. I, haven't, I didn't bring up a, the classic model in, uh, in, in system dynamics on that front. I'll show it to you quickly, which is Lorenz model. Uh, hang on, I've got to go one level up. Now, this is the classic model of complex systems in 1963. Lorenz's model of the of, of, of a stylized version of meteorology. The model has three equilibria. They are all unstable. If you work out the equilibrium of that system, you're working out where it will never be. And yet economics always falls back and says, what's the equilibrium? And then discusses the conditions in that state. In a real genuine dynamic system, you never reach equilibrium. In fact, you're repelled away from it. Your actual dynamics are far from equilibrium. And that's the sense we need to break through into economics. And again, game theory with its emphasis upon equilibrium outcomes is not helping at all. One of Marx's greatest statements was men make their own history, but not at times of their, or circumstances of their own choosing. In other words, it's the constraints that, that often determine the system rather than the behaviour of the individual. If you look at neoclassical economics and Austrian, they both fantasise that you effectively work in an unconstrained space, and therefore what matters is modelling the behaviour of the individuals in it. When you look at the actual institutional structure of capitalism, it's the constraints that matter. And I'm modelling the constraints and say you behave within those constraints, but your behaviour is shaped by them far more so than by your own behaviour. So, so long as I have this incredibly simple idea that workers' wage demands are more likely to be successful, that there's low unemployment than high, I get an outcome which matches the last 30 or 40 years. And if I had to say what really made me realise that the model I built back in 1992 of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, what made me realise it was, it was far more realistic than I even thought myself, was that it predicted the Great Moderation before the Great Moderation happened. Okay? Now, it was an incredibly simple behavioural model. So, uh, yes, we, can't, we, we, we are free-acting agents, but we're free-acting agents inside a structure. And the structure really sets the behaviour more so than our minor. And we have an enormous amount of herd behaviour in capitalism as well, for obvious reasons. And that's what Keynes, when you look at Keynes' treatment of expectations, he was really talking about herd behaviour. So in that case, individual animals might, all be, might be running in a particular direction. The herd's running one way and the herd goes over the cliff at once, except for those who are a handful of contrarians who turned beforehand. I completely agree with you about the laws of thermodynamics. I don't agree about value as in neoclassical value theory being a foundation. But one thing we've left completely out of economics is energy. And that's an enormous sin. 
because we have models of production that assume we can produce output with no energy. But that actually is in defiance of the laws of thermodynamics. And nobody defies the laws of thermodynamics. That's a huge hole in economic theory, which is one area I've been working on and recently published some papers on that topic, or a paper on that topic, which I don't think I've linked here, but I'll link it up when I put the slides together completely. But I show you can, as soon as you acknowledge that energy is necessary for machines or humans to work, then you get an energy theory of production, not a labour and capital theory of production. And I'm going to be having a go at Nordhaus about that, so I want to finish, if I can, on the issues of Nordhaus and the whole idea of how economists claim they're handling climate change, because you all know Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize last year for, quote unquote, integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis. Well, I'm, initially I was fairly, I thought that's a good thing, somebody working in that in economics at least is not as bad as some of the other Nobel Prizes. Then I remember that Nordhaus played a huge role in demolishing the credibility of the limits to growth study. And I then went and checked some of his papers and saw what, am I, what actually got the Nobel Prize. We wrote a paper in 2017, obviously something which was written just before his Nobel Prize. Okay, Not like it's dated or he's changed his mind or anything like that. And in that paper he claims that damages due to climate temperature increase through climate change a 2.1% of GDP at a 3 degree increase and 8.5% of income at a 6 degree Celsius warming. Now I hope you're doing exactly what I'm thinking, going, what the fuck? Pardon the French in the next church. Okay. How on earth could you claim that a 6 degree increase in temperature would only reduce GDP by 8.5%? The last time the planet had that level of temperature was called the Permian extinction and about 80% of all species perished. So how on earth are we going to say the GDP just fall by less than 10% if we're talking about a temperature level that wiped out about 80% of life on earth at the time it last happened? It's just absurd. And the reason is that's his damage function. He uses what he calls his damage function. And it's a simple quadratic. You see, equation three assumes that damages can reasonably well be approximated by a quadratic function of temperature change. Now, I've seen some pretty stupid assumptions in my time reading neoclassical economics, but that has to take the cake. That is absolutely absurd. And it's not just absurd in an abstract theoretical sense. This is the type of model that's used in what they call integrated assessment models that do the economic uh, parts of the assessment of the impact of climate change. Now, that is nonsense, and it's playing with your future to make claims like that. So how did you get that stupid result? Well, I've mentioned that quadratic function there. He includes it does not include sharp thresholds or tipping points. Well, in that case, this is the equation, there's the value. The, the coefficient he has in that quadratic for temperature change is 0 0.00267. Now he's fitted that to data, so-called, and that's the, that's the form of the function, These, the damage function over 1 plus the damage function, where the damage function is 0 0.00267 times t squared, where t squared is the difference between uh, pre-industrial temperatures and now. Now, what that means is, if you graph what he it measures is, is the percentage of the, pop, of the GDP effect where it goes extinct courtesy of climate change. That's what it looks like from the temperature of minus 100 degrees Celsius right up to plus 100 degrees Celsius. So from water being you know, well and truly frozen, 100 degrees below the freezing point of water, to boiling, that's his prediction. So his function says that if we get, say, to the point where the average temperature of the planet is zero, which would mean pretty much the entire place except the poles will be encased in ice. Okay. That predicts about 40% of civilization disappearing. Sheer absolute nonsense. In the other direction, there's a 6% 6 degree increase in temperature, which means we get to Permian levels that drove most of the world life of the planet's population to death. That's just going to be about 9% destroyed. That is absurd.
and it's playing with your futures as well. And the Nobel Prize further legitimised this sort of nonsense. So what I've done here is, it's obviously nonsense to say there are no sharp tipping points. That is an absurd assumption. You can criticise a theory for its assumptions, okay? You can. Obviously you criticise that one. So what I thought I'd do is bring in, just for the fun of it, I don't believe this is anything like a decent replacement for what he's done. But what about bringing in a rational function where there's a, 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 qu a quartic on the numerator or a quadratic on the denominator and the quadratic tells you the temperature at which human civilization is impossible because it gets too cold and the other side impossible because it gets too hot. And so I'd say like an average temperature of zero, which is 15 degrees colder than now, I'm taking is when humanity couldn't function, which I think is fair enough. It's likely to be maybe even six degrees would be enough to do it, not 15, but just for the sake of illustration. And then a higher temperature, I'm using six. I think I'd prefer to use three because I think that'd be enough to wipe out our civilization. Uh, but let's see what it looks like. And then I fit that to what Nordhaus gets for his low range stuff, where he's done his so-called empirical fitting between 0 0.5 and 1.5, I think it was. I went a bit slightly further to get five data points. So the black line is what Nordhaus predicts between minus 15, which takes us back to zero, and plus 10, which takes us well past the Cambrian extinction level. And there are my two functions for a four degree tipping point and a six degree tipping point. Now they overlap for the range of data Nordhaus is talking about. But it's catastrophic if we go much further. So what, we, what Nordhaus did in demolishing the limits to growth, he replaced a sophisticated system dynamics model, which the people who designed the limits to growth hoped we'd be using that technology ourselves in economics and were shocked when economists rejected them instead. And that's direct feedback from one of the three authors, by the way. With a standard Ramsey growth model, welfare maximisation occurring throughout, generally equilibrium with perfect foresight. Well, great. And a Cobb Douglas production function using labour and capital, but of course not energy. And what I've done is I've brought energy into those equations as well. And it precludes by assumption that collapse can occur. Well, that's great. Let's assume nothing's going to go wrong. And he discounts the future at 6% per annum as well, which means every 12 years he's halving the importance of welfare that far in the future. So if you go for 120 years, how much do you value life in 120 years? You give it a 0 0.00098 weight compared to life today. If they all die out, who cares? Okay. That's what I call thinking about the long term. So he trashed the limits to growth. This is the limits to growth model graphically shown back from the book in 1972. And I highly recommend you all go and download a copy and read it. It's a far more realistic system dynamics method. It has feedbacks between growth, resource depletion, pollution, population, etc., all of which are missing in Nordhaus's thinking. And it's far more sensible for analysing the dangers we face than this idea of a damage function. And that's what we should be doing. It's genuine, dynamic, non-equilibrium, non-linear stuff. That's what we need to be able to cope with the situation in which we find ourselves. So back to Black's comment, capitalism may well disappear as a social system before economists understand the dynamics because they reject this approach in behaviour of their own equilibrium nonsense. So neoclassical economics isn't just bad for your health, it's bad for your survival. Thank you.